Hi, this is Joseph and I'm the managing partner here at Zion Associates where we solve legal problems with creative solutions. This E2 extension case is a fashion designer that started a company, got her E2 several years ago, have been running the business to the best of her ability, but because of the pandemic in 2019, 2020, 2021, the company was just not doing as great as she wanted. In fact, it did terribly. In the past year, it only made $30,000 in revenue. And now she has to face the extension. Typically speaking, when you do an E2 extension, the first few years not being okay is relatively excusable. You're just starting out your company, you're investing, you're hiring people. The revenue might not be as beautiful as how you projected it to be. But the second year, third year, fourth year, when you're up to the seventh year and you're ready to do an extension, the company should be thriving by now, at least minimally, right? Well, because of the pandemic, everything collapsed. The revenue she received barely covered the minimal expenses with no employees and didn't pay for her own salary. So how do you go about winning an extension case, letting the consulate officer still believe you and willing to issue you the second extension. This was a very, very difficult case. In fact, the case was so difficult, I told the client, don't hire us. It's not worth it to hire a law firm to do a, such a difficult case, right? The idea is it's worth it to hire a firm to do a complicated case when the amount you pay can increase the success rate a lot, right? You pay a lot, you get a high success rate. Then it's worth it. Or you pay a little and there's little success rate, then it's also worth it. But it doesn't make sense to pay a lot when the success rate isn't going to increase by that much. So I advise the client, look, I know you like us. I know we've represented your whole family to do all these different cases, but just it isn't worth it to hire us to do the full shebang. But what I could do is we could set up many consultations along the way and I could give you all the advice that I can during these consultations and you run with it. That way you pay the least amount and you get the biggest results. And that's what we did. We set up seven consultations at very strategic times before her interview. And we helped with the business plan, we helped with the attorney brief, we helped with all collecting all documents. We interview prepped multiple times, um, even into the night right before the interview so that she can prepare her case to the best of her ability, knowing it's a very, very difficult case. So how do we go about explaining this particularly difficult case during a particularly difficult time to the consular officer. So as I understood this fashion company, the original plan was to create this boutique fashion brand, uh, put her clothing in all the different stores. This, it was gonna be a great company. She has a great portfolio, she has a lot of customers, but everything tanked because no shops were open, the e-commerce wasn't doing well, the Kickstarter didn't kick off, just everything that she did failed. And I initially asked her, like, pretend I'm the officer convince me and all the things that she said i was just like but that just doesn't qualify you for e2 the amount that you invested in the company was very minimal to start you only invested like fifty thousand dollars to start this company and then you didn't really hire anybody you hired like seamstress people part-time on 1099 it wasn't a full-time employee you were using a garage a mini space to build out your company and all the clothing you bought, you created to somebody who's not in fashion just looks like something you can buy from target so how i just don't feel very convinced and last time she already had a very difficult e2 case and the officer already wrote down all these things in her, her notes talking about what kind of company they're doing and so now the second extension you really need to hit the ball out of the park but this past year given the pandemic only made revenue 30,000 made a few pieces for a few customers that paid a high fee how is this possibly going to succeed well let me tell you one of the first things I noticed during this first consultation was where she ended up locating her business. Yes, it was in a garage-like space, only a few hundred square feet for an art studio, but it was in a very famous art district. And it was particularly difficult to get into the art district. I visited that area before, I know it's very hip, but she never mentioned it and it wasn't in any of the documents. But 
because I've been there, I know. And I, from what I heard, it's like, you know, she got a, such a good space. It would be such a shame if the company had to close down because it's so hard to get there. And I asked, why, why is it so hard to get there? Isn't it just a business space, a business lease? You sign, you put a deposit. And she started explaining, no, it's very competitive. You have to do multiple rounds of interview. They only support artists and you have to prove you have an art background. And she won so many awards when she was there. It would just be so sad. She was mentioning this like off the cuff, but little did she know that this would actually be one of the best part of her case. So I asked her more, what, what do you mean it was so hard to get this lease? What was the application process like? How many interviews did you have to go through? How do you prove you're an art person, right? How do you prove that you are an artist? And she was explained to me and she had to get a letter of recommendation and actually prove to be able to get this particular lease because this was a particularly government-funded art district that they want to encourage artists. So she had to go through rounds and rounds of interviews already. And this is amazing for E2 applications on my end because if somebody else already vetted my client, right, to prove that she is an artist and that her company was going to thrive in this environment, well, what is USCIS or what is the, the consular officer got to say to that, right? What well, somebody else already vetted and we proved, look, when she started the company, she started in the garage, yes. But then she was able to prove her worth and prove her stripes, and she was able to get this really prestigious lease. So that was one of the first things that we discovered, and we, we, we tweaked the entire extension to fit that. The second thing was about her revenue. $30,000 a year is not a lot of money, no matter what kind of company you run. But how much revenue you generate is only one factor in how to evaluate a company. Having represented a lot of companies that do a lot of R&D and just is all in the negative all year round for years and years and years before they actually launch an IPO, I know a lot of the different ways to calculate a business's worth. Market share, R&D, awards, customer satisfaction, reviews. There's a lot of things that's way more important to a business then it's revenue. Revenues can go up, it can go down. It could, it's, it's, it's very, very wishy-washy based on the demand. And yes, a lot of USCIS officers and a lot of consul officers, they like to look at the hard numbers. How much do you make? Are you able to afford your salary? Do you pay your employees? And basic requirements of a company. Well, if you're able to prove these other factors and prove that if this extension were granted, then she would be able to come and actually make the company thrive because in the past seven years, she really invested in the more important things to a business and now those things will be able to launch the company. So we focused on the things that she really spent her time on. One of the things that she focused a lot on was getting a lot of awards. So starting the company in the US, making these products, she was able to enter a lot of competitions and win a lot of awards. She won so many awards that we actually thought about if the E2 fails, we can pivot and do an O1 visa for her, which I was pretty confident she would be able to do, but she didn't want the O1 because she was really running the business, so she wanted to stay on the E2. Um, and so we focused on how many awards and media publications she got for her product. She is an artist. The second thing we focused on was the pivot in the customer and the customer segmentation. Before she thought it was going to be all these different stores that's going to hold her product and sell it and she would be able to sell them at a very wholesale price and then she would be able to make the funds. And it was a very basic business model. The company, the, these all these stores would pay her uh, a flat rate and then um, she hires a seamstress to make everything and she makes a small margin. A very basic factory style type of a business plan. But because of the pandemic, all these stores shut down, she had to directly find individual customers. Now these individual customers, because they had bespoke design requirements, she was able to charge four times five times the price that she was originally going to charge each individual piece to these specific places. And the fact that she was making everything and her team was making everything by hand on, 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 um, and directly in store, this was completely different than what the, all the competitors were doing. And so she gained a huge following, a huge social media following, and it was awesome. At the end of the day, when the company letter was prepared, we polished it again and again. The business plan was fine-tuned. We coached her again and again. We practiced the interview techniques, told her to be confident and just go and just show 
her colors. And the officer interviewed her, was just very iffy about the financials, told her to go home, told her to come back, interview her again, told her to go home and send additional questions. We could tell the officer was struggling so much with this case, wanted to approve it, but was really on the chopping block because just didn't meet the bottom line. But based on her representation, how she presented herself, the documents she was able to submit, she won the case. And we were just so, so happy. And this is definitely by far the most difficult case I've done in, in recent history on an E2 extension. There are cases that I've seen that made $300,000, $500,000 in revenue on the extension and still get denied. And she only made 30000 And she's practically a startup stage when it's already been here for seven years. The officer was super suspicious that she was here just you know, as a tourist and trying to date and try to get married. There was all this prejudice when she was being interviewed multiple times. But bottom line, the awards is hard to lie. The 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 award um, the design that she came up with, the way she was able to present herself. She was a very artistic and beautiful person when she was able to present everything. And I think the officer was just like, yes, this is the artist's life. Not every business is like a giant business that sells product or services that make a lot of money. Some businesses are like artists and the immigration law is understanding and majestic in that it's all encompassing and it's up to the officer to make these discretionary judgments on who should get the E2 visa, who should not get it. And based on our presentation, we won. All right, that was our E2 success story. If you have any questions about the E2, if you have any business plans that you wanna launch, this was a student that we represented the first time to do the case, um, to get the business plan certified and help get the case approved, and then now doing the extension seven years later. I'm super thrilled to help students make their dreams come true. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. We'd love to help you too. Take care, bye-bye.